Live streaming is on. Awesome. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I won't uh, let my screen sit on these screens uh, too long, but I want I prepared a few slides um, for this meetup. Uh, and just a few, so I can I can always come back to my my face because this is, won't be a presentation. I think these are just helpful guides for us to remember what we're talking about and maybe um, uh, uh, using some sources and bullet points that I think touch upon the few points we should discuss. So let me just share my screen with you. Perfect. Okay, so everybody can see that, correct? Okay. Yep. Awesome. Uh, so oh, this is the so uh, we wanted to discuss uh, stoicism and relationships, and I think from now on, I'm going to think more about what maybe uh, it's not necessary. This is why I put recommended in here. What maybe we should all consider to to have. Um, um, reflected on and and at least studied a little bit before coming into some of these meetups. Um, so for example, for this meetup, I think it's really useful that we had done a few meetups already on emotions, the passions, cognitive behavioral therapy, and its its practices, um, because we're pretty much already primed to discuss this topic. Uh, we already have those prerequisite, that prerequisite knowledge to understand what are the passions. And so we can kind of, I think as our first uh, light fraga, I thought it would be useful to discuss exactly how do we classify love and how do we classify, how will the Stoics classify um, uh, love, which is a loaded word, uh, love, um, in terms of whether what kind of passion it is, if it is a passion or if it's one of these, um, you could fit it into one of these three um, uh, or how you can fit it into one of these three indifferent emotions that they consider. Um, uh, rational joy, wisdom. Um, so I think this is a really good starting point. How do we classify or define love? Um, and how do we, how do the Stoics, how would the Stoics do that? Um, uh, and I thought maybe I leave this screen on while we discuss this question, um, just because I think this is a really good starting point. If you remember this nice table, these, this nice table I found um, kind of categorizing all the passions that the Stoics had um, basically listed out, uh, especially um, Cicero when he was um, uh, re uh, um, uh, transcribing everything that the Stoics had written that might have been lost. Um, he listed all these different passions, and I, I thought that love based upon the research that I had done, that the, the readings that I had shown you guys, that um, that love would fit into this category of lust, this, um, this an apparent future good, which I thought was an interesting definition of this broad category of lust. And I thought it was also quite interesting. It kind of fits into the same category of passions as anger. Um, I was trying to find a specific word for love in that entire table and this from this source that I um, and that I found this nice categorization of the passions um, I couldn't find one that's called love it's not in there love friendship these kind of passion uh, or, or interpersonal relationship um, uh, emotions that are, that we feel none of them were in there so I was trying to find one that may be connected to what the Stoics would consider as um, maybe a, a longing for somebody else and that was that was uh, what I what I ended up thinking might be closest to their idea of love, this longing or lust or desire for somebody else, whether it's a friend or a romantic partner. Um, but what do you guys think? I mean, would this does this sound like a good starting definition for love um, in terms of how the Stoics would consider it? Yeah, Gonzalo. Um, to to be honest, I will kind of like more classify it as um, this particular rational joy from from my perspective, rather than 
the lost itself. Because in, at some point, let's say when, when you define a relationship, you kind of like, yes, it has this um, initial fire, let's say, but you don't end up choosing your relationship based, based just on that fire, let's say. You end up choosing the rest of the things um, that that came, that, let's say, that come with um, interacting with another person. Um, rather, the comprehension or the compassion with which in which they treat things. Um, so I, I kind of like, I mean, I understand where it's coming from, but I think that it's it fails short on on what love is. It's let's say I I don't want to use the good or bad love, but um, let's say about the best aspects of love. Um, I think that yes, it might be that for some people uh, there is generally more components of lust. Um, but, but, but for me, it's not, um, proper, let's say. Yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right. The, I mean, it's, um, I, the, the, the Stoics definitely didn't discard the idea of, I mean, if, if we want to pick out a certain type of love, um, and let's discuss romantic love. I mean, they obviously didn't. Many of them had wives, many of them had children, many of them had this sort of kind of familial or romantic love. And they, a lot of them were what I think would be considered, would consider each other friends. Um, uh, but I, I'm really glad you said it, rational joy because they did um, uh, in this, um, this really great article I read, actually this is where somewhere where scholars seem to agree seem to think that Epicureans and Stoics agree that you can't enter love in, the, in that, in that for initial passionate phase. I think the word passion is, is different today than how they used it, but you're right that you can't, um, you can never decide on um, uh, entering into a, a loving, friendly relationship in the very beginning. Um, you need to take time with it and then decide. Um, it actually kind of fits in with that kind of scheme that we were talking about with the passions, right? I think um, you uh, you wait, you have to hold off the passion and then wait and rationally decide on whether or not you should enter into this, into this relationship. I think it's um, Epictetus and I, I really forget the quote. Um, there's, a, there's a quote he has actually. Um, where he says um, he says that only the wise can um, should and should become friends, or only only the wise should be should find something about uh, love or friend friendship. He, he says only the wise could do it. Basically, he, that, that's what he concludes is that only the wise and the rational could ever become true, or ever make true friends, because he thinks that you you can't really enter into a relationship. Um, whether friendly, romantic, or familial, you can't enter one unless you are rationally understanding what you're entering into already. So I think this question is quite loaded. And I think what we could draw from what you said, Gonzalo, is that there really is no one kind of love. This They also say this in the, um, uh, and I, I've actually heard of this before, that the, um, this concept of love didn't really exist back then. I think the concept of love we have today comes back from the this um, Victorian European notion of, of true romance. And that never existed back then. They had this idea of, um, um, I think that the, 
the Greeks, but generally people back then had a better idea that you should first become friends before you even enter romantic love, or that romantic love should be founded on, in part on friendship, that they had these different dimensions to love. Um, that um, uh, even romantic love is not even necessarily distinct from friendship in a sense that you could, some, sometimes they overlap. And this is why sometimes people say that they've married their best friend. Um, or uh, um, uh, this is why sometimes you uh, you even see couples who break up who end up becoming lifelong friends. Um, I think there's much more color to the idea of love than this loaded word. Um, kind of like you, I think this is different from the word rational. I'm trying to put it into it and into a way in which to understand it. But I think this is different from the word rational, which is a bit more vague love. I think we understand. And I think we can understand it in its dimensions. Like, um, the chat. Yeah. I can't find it. The direct, uh, Epictetus uh, quote. Yeah, I know. And I know it's, I know it's in his discourses. And for the, and I was actually, I found it the other day. There's a couple of sections in book two or three on this topic, but I could not find it for the life of me today. So I, I don't know. Um, it is in book two or three though. I'm very certain um, he has uh, short sections on um, not, he, he doesn't call them love, but he calls them um, uh, connections or friendships or entering into something with somebody else. Um, uh, but um, yeah, that's a that's a really good quote from Seneca too. I think that also distills Epictetus's position on it. That idea of yeah. self sufficiency is also in the same article. That it's um, you need to be self sufficient. I, I actually um, I wrote this down as uh, I don't know if you guys would agree with me, but this idea of um, uh, self reliance. Um, I use a different word, but I think that's the same thing. You have to you have to kind of have a sense of self knowledge, self reliance, or self sufficiency before you enter into relationships. Kind of like the idea that you should know yourself before you start knowing um, too much externally. Yeah, Gonzalo. I I really don't. I mean, th this is probably something that it's more personal and, and found maybe in, in Buddhism rather than in Stoicism. But I, I mean, I think that we could argue that most of the relationships are based, let's say the deepness of a relationship is based on how vulnerable do you allow to, to be in front of another and how, let's say, how do you choose someone to help you or not? That's for, for me, that's how at least underneath all of the emotions and, and, and all of the other rest of the things that came with, with friendship. Um, I, I mean, the closest ones to me are the ones that, let's say, I feel like they don't mistreat my most vulnerable parts or the parts where maybe I I don't make too much sense even for me um and and for me that's kind of like the important aspect to let's say um to to talk about because I don't think that sharing vulnerability is not being self-sufficient I mean I I understand that I could solve this problem by my own or that um, I know how to reach for help, uh, and I choose that with some rationally with some people and some others I don't. So I I don't I, I see a conflict here in the, in the self um, sufficient term a, a little bit, um, at, at least in that sense. Uh, I'm rationally choosing to share the load with someone else. Uh, that I can see fit for helping me. So in the same sense for me, it's, um, I don't know, I'm still being self-sufficient while being helped by others. Not sure if that's clear. I see. So I think, yeah, just to summarize, so your idea boils down to that, um, uh, how you choose the relationships you have boils down to if you can, you trust to be vulnerable in front of them, 
uh, so you can trust that um, in a given situation, um, they can they can help you in those times of vulnerability, or simply support you um, uh, in those areas in which you're vulnerable or you need help. Um, which not, I not that okay. it's just about uh, because now that you said it, I just noticed something. But not that it's just <laughs> about asking for help. Uh, it's it's more about the sharing part rather than the asking for help. Okay, okay. Uh, Shrikam? Uh, yeah, just uh, saying the, um, the two quotes uh, I posted uh, talk exactly on uh, the matter of uh, uh, trust and uh, self uh, being self-sufficient, uh, but still uh, wanting uh, contact and having contact uh, with other people um, because when you when you are um, like you know stable self-sufficient you're your own uh, person uh, then you can really uh, be uh, communicating uh, how say in a pure way without uh, relying uh, on them but uh, still enjoying uh, the, con the companionship um, I think the the Stoics uh, didn't didn't appreciate uh, how say being uh, dependent on uh, other people Um it's a uh, it's in a weird way uh, individualistic uh, and still um, uh, how to say putting a community in a, in a high um, like with high value high place. Yeah, I also. Um... When I when I read about, um, I mean, I think there's ways to twist and extend the idea of being able to uh, love and being able to share and 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 find mutual support in a friend or a lover. That um, uh, it that always whatever I read that always sounded to me more like a modern Stoic kind of idea. Uh, like in today's age, we're able to kind of extend stoicism to include and to be more more modern in its approach to interpersonal relationships. Whereas when I was reading um, um, about the stoics' positions on um, friendship, love, and other kinds of relationships, that it it sounded um, I wouldn't say outdated. They're just very strict about it. Like the way in which they approached the I, the idea of of love did sound a bit individualistic, um, because it, it it almost sounded like when they were trying to um, treat the idea of friendship and love, they were stepping on hot coals and trying to find a way around it. It was like it was to them, love was maybe maybe this is just because how you know the individuals felt themselves. They were so stoic that they. Um, as soon as this idea of, you know, um, true passion for or true love for uh, another human being, um, whether a friend or other, was coming into their minds, that they felt that this was one of those passions. And so they kind of had to say, it almost sounded like a compromise. Like, it, there it exists. We know humans are going to do it, so we have to find a way to allow it in Stoicism, but remain for Stoics to be self-sufficient and non-dependent on others. That it was, it, it were treading on coals basically is the way in which it felt like. Um, so I didn't exactly agree with that kind of approach. It kind of sounded like they started from a position that sexual desire or true um, loyalty and fidelity to a friend was kind of antithetical, kind of opposite to, to stoicism and to how you treat the passions. And then only afterwards did they 
did they say, hmm, but there has to be a way because humans are going to do it anyway. So you, you should do it, but only only after you follow the virtues, you're, you're wise enough to be self-sufficient if anything happens and um, be rational so you don't become dependent. They used the word, um, I think it's... Um, there's a, the, the article I read made a good distinction, or at least they tried to make a distinction between reliance and dependence. Um, dependence means that if you, um, this it, dependence sounded like toxic, like they were trying to distinguish between this kind of toxic dependence on somebody else and this um, kind of mutual reliance with somebody else. Um, but um which I okay, I would agree with the conclusion. I just won't, wouldn't agree with their kind of approach to it. Um, but I, I do agree that the Stoics still sound very individualistic in how you should be for your, with, with yourself when you enter into another relationship. Um, let me see if I can find... Steve, <clears throat> to yep. add to what you just said, um, I found in uh, Stoic discussions the topic of toxic friendships uh, comes up uh, often, and people ask, how can we use Stoicism to correct those toxic relationships or to get out of them if they cannot be uh, redeemed? And uh, so I think this is an interesting part of our could be a, a part of our discussion on friendships today. How does one get into a friendship like you have on the slide on the screen right now? Do you have some sense of your self-worth, your self-knowledge, uh, therefore helping you avoid um, the problems that come with toxic friendships, uh, perhaps being too much attached to someone or uh, perhaps uh, subject to their bad behaviors and you're around them so much you get pulled into it. So uh, so this is, a, this is, I think, an important area for friendships and stoicism. Yeah, yeah, I do agree that it, it comes up often and I think it's it's also misunderstood. Like you said, like it's, um, uh, it, um, uh, it, it's, I think it's one of those topics in Stoicism that's a bit torn between different people. And I think I think a general approach to this topic is not necessary, I think. I think for for a lot of Stoics, I think um, uh, when Gonzalo said this works for him, I think that's probably more true about this topic than other topics, that this topic on love and relationships, there, there needs to be at least basic conditions of, you know, not 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 falling into this toxic dependency, but past that point, I think you can have many different approaches to it, um, to coping with friendships and relationships, and still still not falling into that toxic dependency they mentioned. Actually, I found I found that um, quote by Epictetus and um, the um, how do I put it? The annotation to it. Um, which I'll put on a different slide. Uh, so uh, this is the quote down here from his discourses. Um, and this is uh, describing both the, actually very something very similar they mentioned about the Stoics and Epicureans approach. Uh, it says that they both, and Epictetus had mentioned this, that um, one of the preconditions for friendship was the attainment of this self-sufficiency. I think Epicurus, they mentioned, talks more about this, um, but they both discuss um, that you need to be self-sufficient before you move forward. Um, I think self-sufficient is that word like rational, Gonzalo, like it's a bit vague and loaded and you don't really know <laughs> exactly. You don't really know what it means because a lot of people construe that it's this egoistic individual, very hyper individual sense. But I don't think that's what the Stoics necessarily meant by it. Um, and then it says, without this inner surrender and resultant inner strength, both mental lucidity and mutually beneficial friendship are impossible. Um, uh, but um, 
I do, I think that a sentence, and I see your hand raised, I think that last sentence, just to end in my spiel, that um, when it says, without this inner surrender and resultant inner strength, I like that phrase because I think what it's saying is that if you can't support yourself, you can't really support other people. I think, I think that's what they, I think maybe that's part of the Stoic philosophy that they're mentioning here. This isn't a quote from the Stoic philosophers. This is an annotation in the article, but um, I, th I really like that phrase because I think what it's saying is that you have to be sure about yourself and confident that you can support yourself before you ever enter into a relationship with somebody else. Um, Gonzalo. Um, yes, and um, maybe I'm stealing a little bit from um, Brené Brown and um, another psychologist um, they they often talk about the, the, this sense where now we have these forbidden words um, like codependency and uh, vulnerability, for example. In in most of society, they are like really bad. Let's say they have like this weight um, of negativity on them. Um, but she also mentions something that. Um, Another psychologist that I can only find in, in Spanish too. Um, um, it says that um, you need that vulnerability in order to truly connect with your self courage. Let's say so. You you cannot have one without the other. Uh, in the same in the same sense that you cannot block uh, a single emotion. You block them all or you block them none. So th that. Th that for me triggers this part in in which uh let's say there are some acceptable levels of of codependency and i think that part of the knowing myself for example is that sometimes i generate this um uh, like avoidance i think that they are called um there's there's a dependency style in which you avoid committing with another person and that sort of thing uh, that it's um, psychologically proven, let's say, um, that creates this sort of things. It's like, okay, I know that about myself. Um, so I know what are things that I need to do in order to truly connect with another human being, let's say, and have a healthy relationship with them. Uh, and, and I think that that's also what that part is kind of like mentioning. You have to surrender to, to that, to your fear, let's say, and follow it through. And that will just uh, create a healthy relationship. Um, that's, I feel like that's sometimes one of the things that um, it's creating these this problems, let's say. You, you either, you are in a, in a, let's say in a codependent uh, bond with someone that doesn't really respect the rules that you have set and now you're stuck in it and yeah you have emotionally invested in something and you need to break it and just start over let's say that's real i know and um i think i think you're right there's a sense that um and again, there's always a toxic side to any kind of emotion or connection. So there is a toxic side to codependency. But I think you're right in the sense that um, if you were truly stoic, you wouldn't mind some level of codependency if, let's say, God forbid, you're, um, you're uh, this person with, with whom you're codependent um, dies or, um, uh, you know, breaks that relationship up with you, um, that you're still able to bounce back. There's that sense of resilience there. Um, and I think as a Stoic, uh, you shouldn't put out of the realm of possibility. You enter into one of these relationships, but still understand you have the inner strength to bounce back if you ever do leave it. Um, because all relationships, you know, basically either, either in this life or until one partner dies, it, they're all temporary. So I think um, there's, a, um, there's a sense of understanding whether in tr like physical death or in this death of the relationship you have to premeditate on this on this on this death you have to um uh negatively visualize um um 
uh, of of that impending death that just could happen, whether the death of the relationship or the death of one of the people involved. Um, and then you can be okay with going into that codependent relationship. Because I, I do agree that it is a kind of a rational joy of getting to understand the, 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 the interesting details of understanding another human being and um, being in a being in a loving relationship with them. And I like how you used courage. So I just put up like a couple of the virtues that I think are most relevant here. And I think the ones I think are men mentioned here, especially are courage and temperance. Like you need that temperance, that inner strength, the, um, the self-discipline before you go in as a precondition. And you also need the courage to enter into that relationship and to, um, and the courage, I think what you what you all would also say based upon what you said is that you need the courage to rely on somebody else so that, um, you know, uh, that I'm basically trying to say courage is like a kind of trust almost in this sense. You need the courage that somebody else to, to rely on somebody else um, and that they will help you in to, to the same extent. Um, I also put some other words that might fall under courage, like um, honesty, vulnerability, like these ideas of opening up and being comfortable with opening up. Um, there's a whole, I'm, I'm, my mind is going through a whole lot of implications for this connecting to stoicism, but maybe I'll, I'll either say this slowly throughout the, throughout the meetup so I don't divulge everything I'm thinking um, because I'd like to hear what anybody else says. But I, I thought this was kind of impertinent and important to kind of connect these back to the virtues. And I think these are good preconditions. Like you need to at least, of course, wisdom and justice are also included, but I think these are very, very important when you enter into a relationship with somebody else. Uh, Shakam. Yeah, so about the uh, uh, trust. So I agree. It's uh, it it you could see it uh, uh, as uh, related to courage. Um, but maybe without wisdom to, um, you know, to to, to judge uh, the the other person's. Uh, uh, values, uh, capabilities, uh, wishes, I don't know. Uh, to build a trust, I think you need, you need wisdom. You need uh, to know what to, to, uh, to look for. Just blind courage, I think, uh, would lead... Uh, to choosing the wrong uh, friend, the wrong partner, and not realizing it. Uh, Abdul, do you have your hand raised? Okay. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, I, I was just wondering about, um, sorry, I may just get a bit off topic here. Uh, maybe w when you said uh, premeditating adversity when it comes to uh, relationship or the death of relationships or death of people that you care about or love. Um, um, I, I was wondering, isn't it enough to um, premeditate that this relationship won't last forever because um, you're either going to die or something bad is going to happen that stops uh, these great moments so um, you tend to let go of unnecessary uh, fallacies or, or shortcomings from the others or tend to be more compassionate uh, compassionate and and be more understanding to maintain the relationship um, isn't it enough to say this will never last forever and I should enjoy as much as I can out of it or like um, is it important also to premeditate or oh, this is happening or oh, oh, visualizing uh, the death of this person or the death of um, the relationship with this person um, 
And what's the relationship between maybe um, the law of attraction? I'm not sure what's the uh, um, uh, uh, Stoic's opinion of the law of attraction. Uh, and and um, yeah, maybe not exactly related to premeditating, but you know, when you're thinking of bad things that can potentially happen, um, happen in the future, it has something to do with it. Sorry, I'm. I don't want to get off, off topic here. Just no, you're topic. okay. You're okay. Um, so I, you have two questions, and to be honest, overall, I have no good answer. <laughs> Actually, those these are things I'm not. I I don't really know. Actually, you bring up a really good question about the negative visualization aspect. Um, what to recommend to somebody in terms of the extent to you visualize? I so this is what works for me. I personally like to actually visualize something happening like um and i kind of i don't know if this is a bad sign of mental health or a good sign but to, for me it has never led me to any kind of depressive or sad state it has always helped me to appreciate the good i see and then the happiness i have in my life so for me this has really worked just it's just to preface it but like if um if i hear my mother is going on a trip or if my grandmother is sick and hasn't gotten the vaccine yet for COVID-19, I will, I will just habitually, I think this has happened over time now, that I will premeditate what if she one of them falls ill of the virus and and, and dies, something like that. And I, I do visualize it very, very specifically. Um how will I feel? I will leave work immediately, go to go back home, visit my family, make arrangements, um, be with my brother. Like I have these very detailed visualizations and that's what works for me. I, I really don't know. Like I can't, I don't think I'm in a position to really prescribe you a specific kind of negative visualization because I just, to be honest, I just don't know. Um, and about your um, law of attraction question, I have no idea. I'm not really well versed in what the law of attraction is. I don't. I don't know what it is. Um, I've heard of it in passing, but I'm not. I've never read up on it or anything. So I. I wouldn't be in a good position to answer answer that. Um, okay, Gonzalo. Um, I. I also. I'm in a, in no good place to give you uh, neither advice or. Um, an answer, let's say. Um, I do believe that you should have a backup plan for everything. That's kind of like my anxious self speaking. <laughs> um, and then you should try to um, know yourself better in how to cope with different situations, which I think with, in, in some aspect is what Steve it's, it's doing. Um, but I also, in, in this sense, um, I can only give you the Buddhist aspect about, about the word forever. And um, one of the things that my, my Buddhist teacher first told me was like, it, it was more related to this. Um, there are a lot of words uh, that the human brain cannot comprehend. It doesn't understand what forever is. It has a notion uh, related to how big something is, but that's it. Uh, forever, always, um, none are, are things that are so big for our mind to understand that it's a concept that we cannot use any <laughs> um, because it's, um, it's, it's really incomprehensive for us. So when, when you start thinking about, okay, I will commit into this relationship because it's forever, then I think that you're conditioning your choices, let's say, instead of, but this is again, just because it's a Buddhist perspective. Uh, in Buddhism, we have this idea of um, living in the present moment um, and, and force yourself to live in this present moment uh, constantly without worrying too much about the future and without uh, dwelling too much about the past. So you have to work with what you have, let's say, right now. Uh, and that sort of thing is uh, the thing that works for me. It's like, OK, I'm committed into this relationship right now. And I will start to check myself. Um, or let's say more than I want to commit into this relationship right now. And I will start to find ways of 
disproving myself and what what's happening let's say what should what should i need in terms for this thing to to be proved wrong let's say um and i think that's kind of like the negative visualization that i used to it's like okay let's do pros and cons and and what are the things that for me will say ha huh, i cannot be in a relationship with this person and, and i'll try to seek that um more like this is a really weird um buddhist technique because you are observing a moment without actually judging it um and and you are having a space between yourself and the actions caused by yourself which is like a really weird thing um and i'm pretty sure that i'm not explaining correctly um because you have like this mental space let's say um in between the things that are going wrong let's say in a relationship i'm not able to communicate this or i'm not able to trust in this person um and and yourself that it's the person that that it's the entity let's say that has to deal with that things uh, internally like how am i feeling with this thing going uh, sour and that sort of things so you create the space in between them so that um you can you can observe without judging and and in that you give more space uh for trying new things without um let's say feeling the burden about the, the burden of being uh perfect all the time i think that that's also kind of like the thing i'm not sure if i'm making myself clear this is like really tangled inside my brain um But I think, that we can go with, I think that we can go with the beginning, uh, let's say. I think that's the more clear part. You know, what you're describing is very difficult um, uh, to, to bring all into one argument. Uh, what are the characteristics of this person that I, that I like or dislike or I can't live with? Uh, how do I feel about this person? Do I want to be with them because they're a good match for me? Uh, or maybe just a so-so match. There's a, a lot of psychology that goes into this. And it's uh, it's interesting to hear the Buddhist perspective as well as to discuss the Stoic perspective like uh, for our meeting today in general. <clears throat> I'm just thinking that um, a Stoic would also, I think, compromise a bit about the adversity in a relationship because if um i i deal like think reflecting on a relationship and how you're being treated in a relationship or how you feel i think is very different than contemplating the sage when you contemplate the sage you only have yourself to think about but when you contemplate a relationship um and you you contemplate hmm is it going well um, is this affecting me too negatively? And is this impinging on my, let's say, my own individuality that maybe we should stop this? Um, I think there's an extent to which you accept uh, what you don't like in other people. Um, because as a Stoic would say, I think this is this, this what plays a huge part in this is the dichotomy of control. You can't, um, uh, when reflecting on kind of these negative aspects of a relationship, you also have to take into account that some things you you shouldn't try to control your other partner. You shouldn't try and um, uh, I think um, a stoic would not say that if anything disturbs you, you should leave it. That's an that's more of an Epicurean sense. Um, so I think um, when you do reflect, I would say to use that dichotomy of control as well. And um, okay, um, and to. Um, uh, definitely also understand that there's um because an epicurean would recede an epicurean would um kind of retreat out of that relationship or society at least in general that from what i understand that's what their position is um but a stoic would um usually understand that um it's okay some for some things to be out of control accept it and um if there's some large concerns of course you should bring you should bring them up and reflect on it and maybe that that um and i think Medita premeditating 
um, uh, these or using this negative visualization helps um, to understand that you can you can help predict and help understand um, um, what um, what that um, what's like the worst thing your your partner could do and you could um, you would you would still stay with them or um, uh, remain friends or a lover with them or what's the worst thing that you could they would do and um, just past the point of um, no return for you you know you could um, you could use this tool in very varied ways um, I think so it, it, this is not like this approach of negative visualization I'm just going to use the the English term that um, I think has many colors to it there's not one way to use it um, so uh yeah i think i think we would all give very different answers actually i'm very interested to hear what anybody else has to say how they how they use this approach but it's a, it's something i think we would all use very differently because it's um it kind of is a broad concept but not necessarily a specific prescribed technique if you if you get what i'm saying um yeah Sorry, we couldn't really answer your law of attraction question. I'm not sure if I have I have the uh, the knowledge to understand what it is, but um, or or the knowledge to um to really respond to it. Yeah. How does that feel? I mean, how does that does that help you? This this input, Abdul. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, mm -hmm. um, it was really um a curious question about the law of attraction uh, because yeah um I, I do kind of find it unrealistic sometimes especially when you hear people who are talking about it um um, um but yeah I, I just wanted to know this total perspective if it's not clear that's fine i mean at, at the end of the day um <laughs> stoics don't have should don't have to have views <laughs> with or against um, every other thing is existing. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate your efforts, folks. Much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, so, and I think we're well past the point of um, defining love and um, understanding preconditions for it. I think that's the biggest precondition. I don't think there's too much else that the Stoics have to say about interpersonal connections with other people other than you should first be self-sufficient um, and, and self-controlled or tempered um, and, and wise. They do mention wisdom and this rational wisdom, this rational joy um, before you ever enter into a relationship. But I'm pretty sure that's the most they deal with it. They don't, and I don't think they mention too much about um, actually being in a relationship. They actually mention everything you have to do before, um, because I, I think this also falls in line with most of what they say. Is that um, I'll come back to my screen for a second. Um, there it is. Um, I, I don't think they have much to say about when you're in a relationship, what to do, because I think this falls in line with actually what they what they do with the virtues. Follow the virtues and peace of mind, tranquility, this um, uh, ataraxia will follow from that. And I think they would say the same thing about relationships and friendships. As long as you follow the virtues, you're self-sufficient. Everything like the relationship and friendship will follow afterwards and, and you will be you'll be just fine. You know, as long as you as long as you follow the virtues um, and something I don't think often that um, I think uh, Seneca discusses this more than more than other historic philosophers. But I think it's highlighted, especially by by the modern stoicism movement, that you should um, never do anything outside the the vir your, your personal character uh, characters uh, characteristics and virtues that you uphold um there's a phrase what is it don't um don't do anything against your own virtues something like that they you should always follow and align yourself with the virtues and characteristics you uphold as being good virtues 
um, whether they're the same or they're different. If you uphold honesty very highly, then you should enter into a relationship that's very honest and open. And so it's it's really, I think, based upon what you feel. Um, but as long as you follow your virtues in the beginning, everything else follows. I thought that was interesting. They never mention how you deal with relationships in the actual relationship. They never, they always really discuss what your, their preconditions are. Um, and they have more to say about professional relationships, right? I mean, the Seneca and Marcus Aurelius, uh, they discuss more about their relationships with other senators and, and noblemen and professionals than they do actually with familial relationships um most of the time um so i think you can get more out of like a professional occupational relationship advice from the stoics than you can with other kinds of relationships that's a good point steve i i've heard some uh, entrepreneurs when they talk about starting a new company they are all concerned about how much money can i make how big a company can i create how many people can i hire uh, and uh, nowhere in there is a statement of virtue. Do I want to provide a good product to the public? Do I want to treat customers well? Um, so yeah, in our in our business relationship, there's uh, the same type of consideration. How can I keep my virtues? What are my virtues? I think um, I really like how you quit quoting Seneca because I think Seneca would, um, uh, I think this falls in line with what you're saying, Dan, these entrepreneurs all kind of make friends with each other. And so this falls in line with, and I think Seneca understood this really well, that who you make friends with is who you become almost. It's that saying that whoever you surround with is who you are, what, what you eat is what you are. Um, that, um, uh, these entrepreneurs and businessmen, if they only talk to each other, they're obviously only going to prioritize as a virtue of profit over everything else because they don't consider anything else. But um, if you make friends with the right people and you choose your friends rationally and carefully and wisely, then I think um, uh, especially those friends who might have similar virtues to you um, to an extent, then I think you'll make better choices in the long run about not just um who who your friends are but about the decisions you make in day-to-day -day life especially you know businessmen and entrepreneurs it's a really good point when you mention entrepreneurs um and this really this really ties in well with who which friends you make yeah sure come um so yeah, that's, um, that's, I think, a very central idea uh, of the um, how the Stoics uh, approach uh, friendships. Um, and there is a, a guy who writes that um, you shouldn't uh, call like anybody uh, that like, you like forgot his name friend um because like you didn't uh, build the uh, the trust you you don't know uh their values uh so they're not really your friends um and uh, i think there's um tendency to call anybody or uh, like everybody friends um like my friends from work, my friends uh, from school. Um, but in reality, like, like most of the time, they weren't friends. They were colleagues. They were students uh, in the class. Um, but yeah, that's more about friendship uh, than, than uh, love. Uh, and about being uh, self-sufficient. Um, what uh, as an answer to uh, Gonzalo. Um, it's not about not wanting to have uh, relationships. 
Um, but I think it's more about not needing them as an integral part of yourself, of your identity. A stoic friendship will be you're a complete person and you have a, you know, a, a, it's called like a, like a, a counter, like somebody a, you can be vulnerable with, you, you can't trust completely. But when this uh, person is gone, um, you won't lose yourself. That's uh, yeah. That's what I think. That's a that's a really good point. The um, to frame it like that. Hey, Tony. Sorry, about it, guys. Thanks. No worries. Um, and we're just hitting it. Actually, you you can you can slip right in, Tony, because we're talking. We're still talking about the central idea of stoicism. That before you enter into a relationship, a friendship, you should be first check that um, you're following the virtues and that you're self sufficient. They really highlight this idea of self sufficiency before you enter into a relationship. Um, and I really like the way you changed you framed it, Shakam, that um, this self sufficiency is like an insurance package. It's um, it, when you when you're self sufficient first, and then you enter into a relationship, you um, you are assuring that if anything happens, or that if you realize that your friend or partner or uh, another uh, person in your relationship is um, uh, asking you to un you know do something against your virtues, your your personal characteristics you would like to uphold. Um, then this insurance package, the self sufficiency, will make sure you um, or this this um, these virtues of wisdom and temperance will and really courage also take the courage to do it. Will make sure that you you do uphold your virtues and you do go your own way. Um, actually, I was just um, uh, I'm, I'm, there's this really good moment in a TV show um, that um, that I watch. Uh, I'm a big fan of South Park, I'm a big fan of the American TV show South Park. Um, but there's actually a really good stoic moment in one of it, uh, in, in, in the latest episode where the four main friends um, in the most recent episode decide to break up. They decide they've had it with their friendship um, because over the course of this entire episode is basically centered around this B plot, is centered around their dispute with one another. What to do with with the with the they they steal vaccines and they're all deciding what to what to do about it, but they're all really passionate about it. They're all fighting with each other and they have these, these long discussions about what to do. And in the end of the episode, they basically they basically say like a like a kind of a um what's what's the uh, phrase like a sweet goodbye out of it. Like I hope you guys all good all, all do well. I'll see you around. I hope you're all, you're all going to be doing well in the future. I have my own friends to hang out with now, and they kind of part ways. And it was kind of this 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 very stoic moment that they understood that um, there comes a point in which uh, some things end, some relationships end, and you have to follow. You have to go with you. You cannot sacrifice yourself um, for the sake of a friendship or a partner. Um, there might be um, uh, uh, some exceptions, and I'll get to that in a second. But um, but you really can't. And the self sufficiency package, I think, is an assurance package that really ensures that. And I wanted to mention that um, I don't I don't know if this is actually contradictory to another Stoic, actually, because Hierocles, which I think we'll we'll talk about more next week in, in terms of cosmopolitanism, but. Um, Hierocles and his his circles he he envisaged um, seem a bit I don't know if you guys would agree contradictory to it he 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 talked about tips and advice to give people like um, when you go out in the world to kind of call not a stranger but to call um, maybe a, a a colleague or, or some somebody else you know brother uncle. Um, call them by these familial names to get used to the idea that everybody is a human being and you should treat them like that. Um, and I, I wonder if, um, uh, and Hierocles was, at least from the literature I've read, was a, a Stoic for the most part. He, he really put the cosmopolitanism into Stoicism. But I wonder if this idea of um, 
understanding um, other people as um, your your friends or close family because you, you're trying to enlarge your circle to this this wider community and society um, of being connected to them. I wonder if this is contradictory to this i to this idea Shrikan brought up that. Um, you know, choose your friends carefully, which is something Seneca and the other other Stoics do. Choose your friends very carefully and only choose your friends who you want to be surrounded with, who, who kind of have similar virtues to you. And I wonder if these are two contradictory ideas in Stoicism. Because I too kind of have a soft spot for both of them. These both ideas resonate with me, um, but I'm wondering to what extent you should tolerate, or you should um, uh, tolerate is not the best word. You should um, uh, encompass other people outside of your circle of friends, um, or maybe if the friend, if the word friend is loaded, if the word friend is something we should ditch, we should maybe talk about different kinds of friends and and so forth. Maybe using the word friend in this discussion is a bit too general. Sort of, uh, <laughs> really good quote. Sorry, sorry Dan. It's a Shakam really a poignant quote to, to make right now. Um, now, if you use this word of ours in the popular sense and called him friend, <laughs> in the same way in which we speak of all candidates, uh, yeah, that's a good point. He says we shouldn't use friend too casually, too. It's a really good point. God, um, maybe it's the. Um, sorry, Dan. Go ahead. <laughs> So along those same lines, what I was remembering uh, from Heracles and his writing was uh, the term okiosis and how it relates to self-preservation. And I think that we we can view friendship uh, kind of, you know, some of the interesting points that were made earlier today is a friendship uh, is a support mechanism, but also a toxic friendship can be a big negative in your life. So you have to decide yourself that balancing, that self-preservation, not only for you, but for others. And um, uh, I, know, I know one year in my past, uh, we had a, a business relationship with a person who was very toxic to the whole organization. And the organization had to consider, do we kick this person out? Uh, do we fire them? Because uh, it was toxic in, in that sense. So uh, that's another way to think of uh, Hierocles and how he's a part of this equation. Shagam. Um, I think uh, I can find some uh, quotes about uh, yeah, the universal uh, love that brings everything together as the you know, the force that holds uh, uh, nature and uh, the humans together but i don't think it's a conflict with not trusting uh, everybody i mean Okay, I don't think uh, a crotch is, is the best um, metaphor, but it's like if you hurt uh, your your foot and you use a crotch, you need to trust it. Um, and if you imagine like a old fashioned like wooden uh, crotch, you need to check that it's not rotten. Um, although uh, the nature of uh, of humans is is to connect, although uh, our will is to uh, to love and trust, you can't uh, follow blindly on just the nature of things. You need to uh, <laughs> to check and see for yourself. So, yeah, everybody is your brother, but not uh, everyone is, uh, is your friend. Mm. 
Actually, that's a really good quote that basically encapsulates this idea of dependency. You must um, you must stand erect, but not be kept erect by others. Yeah, it's a really good one. Um, even even with friends, I think this, as a Stoic, um, I would I would say not to um, uh, not to rely a hundred percent on. You need to have an extent of self sufficiency. And again, like we said before, that um, anytime. Um, and that relationship ends, whether in death or because of another factor and dependent on the relationship that you should be ready to be self-sufficient and, and, re and resilient. And I really like um, how both Dan and Shakam really uh, emphasize this idea of toxicity uh, and whether or not you find a rotten tomato or apple in the, in the bunch that you're trying to keep together, that um, it's... Uh, I think it's really based on context, and it's also um, not foregoing the idea that you are a brother, so to speak, of other human beings, um, that um, uh, you have a circle of friends, which as Seneca said, should be kept closely. They are, you shouldn't use as a, you shouldn't use lightly as a word. Um, this is actually why I've stopped using the word friend for coworkers. I I really just try and emphasize the word coworker. And I I do have some co there's like two coworkers who have become friends. And I will call them friends just because outside of work and past the point we work together, we've been hanging out with each other and, and, and really getting to know each other for years. But um I've really tried to separate coworkers and friends. Um but even the word coworker is a is a in uh a bit more ameliorate or friendly to use than the word somebody I work with. Um, uh, but um, in the, in the U S it's quite common. If you, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure of um, uh, other, other countries or cultures, but it's quite common in the U S if you're um, uh, to use brother as a kind of slang word, uh, slang in like, um, um, uh, casually talking about um, uh, talking to somebody and you say it's you know um, good to meet you brother see you have a good day and use that like kind of very casually which I don't think is um, contradictory also um, I think there's a way in which you can balance who's friends and who's brother it's also um, uh, kind of like thinking about my own family is my last word on this that um, I I consider my brother my brother my my actual brother by blood, um, but I would never consider him a friend. Like we have very little in common. Um, I don't think we would ever uh, hang out for a whole week and just just do things together because we don't mesh like that. But I I see him and I talk to him and I'll I I, I visit him and I'll have family gatherings with him. And I, I'll tell him I love him, but it's very different than a friend, which is um, a different kind of person in your life. Um, yeah, I think it's also helpful if you think about these circles of hierarchies that they're not just encompassing one another. Um, I think it's actually maybe a bit false to think of it like that, that like um, like in, in sets, um, that uh, you have yourself, you have your close friends, maybe other friends, coworkers, uh, your community, society, I don't think they're necessarily encompassing each other. I think um, they they come with notations or, or uh, in each of these kind of circles um, that, um, uh, that they're just meant to show how far somebody is away from you in terms of knowing you, but not necessarily in terms of um, your friends are included in the rest of society. Um, because you treat the rest of society differently sometimes than you do treat your friends. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that example about the circles and how they don't necessarily include the smaller ones within it. There could be some exceptions. Um, yeah. I think there are also some friendships that are exceptions in a way. Uh, for example, in this uh, pandemic in the last year, I've joined one group where there's one individual in that group that he and I think alike so much in terms of discussions that very often I will add to the discussion and he will say, Dan, you, you said exactly what I was going to say. And sometimes I withhold, like I did two weeks ago in a meeting, I withhold, I thought to myself, I could say this, but I won't. Then he said exactly what I was going to say. 
And it's it's like the two of us, whether you consider it a friendship or not, we reach the same conclusions based upon the context of the conversation. That's, I think, a, a, one of the special kinds of friendships you can have where two people are um, just agreeing in a certain way. Yeah, Tony. Yeah, I, I think I missed the part on self-reliance, but it's it's a particular point of interest for me. It has been for a long time. I know Ralph Waldo Emerson did essays on it, and I discovered them quite a long time ago. Um, this whole aspect of self-reliance in relation to Stoicism, I think, is inescapable. Um, and that's why I put the quote up by Marcus Aurelius. You know, people generally will be quite transient through our lives. Um, maybe a few friends will, will stick for the duration. But I really think the aspect of self-reliance is absolutely inescapable. It's all down to us individually in, in the end, whether we like it or not. Um, I'm just wondering what your views are on, on self-reliance, really, in that context. Um, yeah, it is something we had, we actually spent a lot, a lot of good time in the beginning talking about self-sufficiency or self-reliance. Um, but it is something that the, the, the Stoics like emphasize actually, uh, in the very beginning, I was mentioning how the, the main article I found, which I, I really loved, it was really basically the one thing I needed to read to, uh, to put my footing on this topic in terms of the Hellenistic philosophies that they, that both Epicureans and Stoics rely on this idea of um, uh, self-sufficiency and non-dependency, they call it. Um, mm. they, actually, um, they actually distinguish between um, depending on someone and relying on someone. So you can be self-sufficient, uh, self-reliant and rely on someone else as a, as a partner, as a good, as a good friend, um, but not, have, not kind of fall into this toxic dependency um, with someone. Um, uh, Gonzalo also made a few good points about um, that this idea of codependent, like words can be messy. So when I say codependency, I, I'm not talking about this toxic dependency. Um, and Gonzalo said it right that um, that there there is an extent to which when you go into a relationship, whatever kind, you um, you kind of make yourself vulnerable. Uh, and you, um, you kind of trust them to an extent you wouldn't trust anybody else, um, whether a friend or a romantic partner. Um, and so you do, in part, it, to some extent, rely on that person. Um, but um, uh, if, let's say, they betray your trust or they break that relationship up, um, there's always a sense in which you have to be self-reliant and self-sufficient so that if you do break that relationship up, whether in death or otherwise, you, you can bounce back. And if they break your trust, you can kind of understand it as it's out of your control and I'm self-sufficient and I can deal with it, whatever comes my way after they broke my trust. Um, I think those are... Um, I really like this idea. We were discussing it a lot because it sounded so this idea of self-sufficiency or self-reliance. Uh, at first, Shakam pointed out it was very. It might have sounded very individualistic, um, the way in which the Stoics are talking about it. Um, but um, it really is a nice precondition for for going into a friendship or a romantic relationship um, because it is. Um, you can't. You shouldn't be dependent on somebody else before you are, you're ever self-dependent. Mm. And that was kind of just trying to summarize everything we were discussing, but that was, um, uh, no, it's good you, you, it's good you mentioned it again, because it's something we should always go back to, because if it is a precondition for these kinds of relationships, um, it is something we should remind ourselves to be whenever we want to enter a new friendship or relationship. Are, am I okay? Am I, following the, am, am I following my own virtues? Am I comfortable with who I am and what I believe? And am I self-reliant? And then as, use, this, as, use that as a benchmark and then, and then move forward. Um, hmm. It is, um, unless, uh, oh, Tony, did you have your hand up again? No. Oh, okay, okay. Um, uh, 
it is almost 5.30, and I did have one last question, uh, one last prompt on my list. So if, if nobody else had any other input on this specific topic of self-sufficiency, uh, I'm wondering because um, in, in media and pop culture, um, love is usually described in very, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not esoteric, but um, uh, superficial. Very, maybe superficial. Um, I want to say vague ways, but maybe that's maybe I'm saying the same thing. Like they're, it's used in ways that nobody really understands. So when somebody say says I love you or you describe love, um, that uh, in today's society that it's described very superficially. Is either physically or if it's not, it's described very vaguely and really non-understandable, non-comprehensible, at least if you try and boil it down rationally. Um, but my ba basic question is because people, different people might argue differently about having um, having a um, passion, not in the sense of the Stoics, but having a passion for somebody else. Um, does loving, does loving rationally in the Stoic sense, does being able to love rationally take the love out of it that's my question i don't know i don't know how else to phrase it but i'm wondering if um because there's there's that sense also seneca described the difference between a true friend and the way in which we casually say friend i think there's a difference between uh, a, a kind of a stoic sense of love and the casual way of talking about love and i'm wondering if, if this um hyper emotional um feeling of love <laughs> Basically, is there any good merit to it? Um, and Or does the rational love of Stoicism take the true emotion out of it, is what I'm trying to ask. Um, my basic question. Um, uh, Abdul. Yeah. It's just complicated one to answer, really. Um, short answer, I don't know. But potentially, what would be the case is um, perhaps rationality, I mean, is all about purpose. And you're wise. You're asking why I'm having this relationship. So if your whys are weak or doesn't make sense, um, and kind of getting into the logical fallacies, why do you like them? Because I enjoy being with this person. Or I like him because I enjoy being with this person. Like, ha not having good reason, taking out the rationality out of it. But definitely having the right reasons for having a relationship would make it stronger, guarantees that it would last for long. It doesn't mean that we're dealing with rationality all the time. In fact, I think applying um, the right type of emotions is still a rational thing to do because um, it's a problem that, like we always deal with, with our emotions and we're, when we're dealing rationally, we're not extracting ourselves from our emotions, but rather um, implementing the right type of emotions for the particular situation based on our experience, knowledge, and uh, the situation we're in. That's, uh, I mean, that's how I, how I see it, huh. at least for now, <laughs> so far, I mean. Uh... I also like how you brought up the, um, uh, the, the loaded word rational. I mean, it's. Um, I think when we when we hear rational, um, we often think of something dispassionate in the modern sense, not the way in which the Stoics would think of disinterestedness or dispassionate. They would think of um, uh, even disinterestedness. It meant something different back then. Um, uh, but for us, I think we often think of something dispassionate or emotional. But um, uh, the word rational, you're right, in this context might just connote or might just bring up the idea that um, you should do things with thought beforehand rather than just falling right into it. Um, so that you're not sacrificing the emotion. 
um, like you, 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 like you said, there's no need to sacrifice the emotion out of this. Um, but um, rational might just try to basically, as an adjective, show that you're trying to be thoughtful about entering this relationship rather than falling right into it, um, which is a good point. Uh, so there may may not be any kind of um, uh, um, uh, joylessness or unemotional uh, component of rational love. Um, rational love might just be this rational joy. Like experiencing rational love might be this rational joy the Stoics allow for. Um, and that um, uh, they, they describe it differently. But I really like the way in which we're trying to define at least maybe I get the sense what you're saying is that um, the word rational, a good way to understand rational in this context is um, uh, sufficing that precondition, that you're self-sufficient, that you've thought it through, you've thought it through, and then now you can enter this relationship. So rational is not so much what you're experiencing at the moment in terms of joy or love, but what you're doing to fulfill that love and joy. Um, which is which is very different so it kind of preserves the emotion um which emo human beings are emotional creatures so why would you necessarily want to sacrifice it um but it also allows you to have thought uh as part of your decision making in the relationship um first uh, um was how Abdul said. Uh, I, I I agree, and I see reason. Yeah, not as um, as a, something that is opposing uh, emotion. Uh, this is just our ruling faculty, and we can uh, act intentionally according to emotions and be reasonable. Um, I don't think it means cold logic. And about uh, love in the, um, I don't know if, if to call it the popular sense, the modern sense, the media sense. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion between Lust, um, a passion, love, a, and just sexual attraction. Uh, it's all mixed together in how the, the media um, builds uh, this uh, um, romantic picture, um, which I think... I think it actually messes up with uh, people's expectations and is causing a lot of uh, harm. Um, and yeah, so how I see love in the, in the stoic sense is something that is guided uh, by intentional uh, and uh, daily decisions. Um, it's not uh, this um, really strong emotion that uh, floods you. It can be a part of it, but just uh, the intentionality of um, uh, how it's called um, re really caring for for a connection with uh, somebody really caring for a relationship um i think that's uh that would be love it's a nice broad sense of love too that you know in love and when we talk of love because I'm also trying to talk about all kinds of relationships that we're not talking about um, uh, caring for a romantic partner, but love may be that sense of um, uh, caring for somebody else's um, wants or needs um, and relying on them to do the same for you. If that's a professional relationship, then you know 
your job or task or favors you need to do for your colleague may be something that you um you want to fulfill. Maybe that could be a part of loving another human being in that in in that context could be sufficing what you need to do for your colleague or for your friend might be a favor that they ask of you um, without any conditions attached to it because you know that they are that you can rely on them. And so um, this idea of love could maybe is a good broad sense of how to use how to apply it to other contexts as well. Um, I want to show you my screen actually um, because I am building uh, maybe a small set of tactics that we can use in order to deal with relationships. And I added this, I added this last one also. Um, we talked about <coughs> efficiency. We talked a lot about um, negative visualization. And then I also uh, added something that um, we do mention often, but it's something that um, maybe we don't write down often enough. And uh, manage your expectations. That's a really good one, especially in today's society when you have advertisements, you know, um, pouring over every screen you see, um, you have um, uh, tons of dating apps or tons of um, uh, TV screens and TV shows and movies depicting how friendships should be, um, that, um, that managing your expectations is really key because um, these may give you false expectations. And um, I think uh, I'm, I'm no expert in how to how, and dealing with this either at a macro scale or psychologically on an individual scale, but I would assume it might be a, more of a condition today than in the past that a lot of people were having trouble um, separating the real relationship from the you know the advertised relationship we see all around us, um, and this is definitely something I think we should always be doing: is managing our expectations, what really goes on in a relationship. And I think I'm just trying to bring everything else together. Um, there is also this sense of when you manage your expectations, uh, understand, um, bring with that the dichotomy of control, that um, you can't account for everything that happens in a relationship. It shouldn't be maybe as a kind of a, a corollary to this manage your expectations to, to calm what you were saying that um, uh, this popular idea of love, um, it's not ideal love uh, whatever kind of relationship you're going into it's not going to be ideal and when you meditate on that understanding that those non-ideal parts are out of your control to an extent is probably very wise very wise to do before you um before you have to deal with them in the first place it's also interesting a lot of these tactics are preventative you know a lot of these tactics are not something you do after the fact i, th I think all, all of these actually are quite good as preventative measures to deal with everything in the future. Um, so they're not something that you do to remedy a situation, but they're something to do before you even enter a relationship of some kind. Um, I didn't see whose hand was raised first, but I believe it was Dan's and, and then Chicago's. Um, Dan? Sure, here's a short comment uh, on this uh, managing of expectations is beyond the uh, friendships and the partnerships that we can form in our lives. We also have to realize this is an internet age and anyone can friend you on Facebook and start chatting with you. And you have to, uh, from experience, you have to learn to see that this is probably a scam. They're talking to me too much, too quickly. And, um, uh, and it will only end in one way. In fact, that's beyond the dichotomy of control. That's realizing something's beyond your control and you already know where it's headed. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, it's some person who claims to be, you know, in Austria or South Africa, but they could be anywhere in the world and they're going to ask you for $500 after five days of chatting you up on, on Facebook. So it's, um, that's, that's like a special category for me. Um, just to interject before the Shakam, just wanted to mention that's a really good that's a really good example. If you want to visualize the distinction between treating other human beings as your brothers and your friends, you would give your friend five hundred dollars to loan because they're your close friend and you can trust them, but you wouldn't give that to a stranger. It's a really good example of making that distinction. Uh, Shakam, I mean, we can just uh, blame uh, Tuku. Zuckerberg and uh, Facebook uh, for 
make uh, using uh, the term friend uh, extremely cheaply and um, <laughs> yeah um, so uh, yeah what do I want to say about uh, managing uh, expectations um, the um, the false promise of uh, everlasting true love with your uh, one and only soulmate that um, I mean it's Hollywood but uh, also uh, um, I don't know like legends and and stuff um, for me it's uh, it's it's all on the same f um, false expectations uh, from uh, happiness because if you look at uh, uh, the movies and such, when people are happy, they are uh, on cloud nine. Like uh, they are just so over the top happy. And if you don't feel this way, maybe you're not happy. And, so if he wants to come in and play, you know he can. If he and wants to come I in and play, he can. No, I think Tony is speaking to his friend. Yeah, I couldn't hear. Uh, oh, yeah. So it's not somebody in the background. Oh, kids. Um, anyway, so when I changed uh, the, um, the, just the definition of what happy and happiness is uh, to being uh, content and, you know, not in pain uh, not suffering, then I um you know, just by definition became more happy and so i think being in love can have can um have the same treatment and just a, a reduction um in intensity uh, can bring bring you more of it I think I'll boil that down to don't focus on the happiness. Yeah, you know, part of your manage your expectations also as we're going through this. That um, don't focus on the happiness. Don't focus on the love. That just comes with the territory of being in that relationship. It's kind of like love. You know, love, happiness. These are kind of like ataraxia, the state of um, tranquility. It just comes with following the virtues and being in good relationships. And it's a really good point. Um, don't focus on happiness. It's a good one. Um, um, not to come. Abdul. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to um, say that um, Dan here is making very good point and giving very good example when he's talking about Facebook. And uh, I uh, maybe maybe um, now um, realizing this uh, is I, I feel that maybe some people are can easily use the word uh, friend generally and and easily calling people friends is because of these social media you know they call whoever in your contact list as friend where they're not they're not necessarily are your friends but there are people that you frequently contact or you just added, but you don't have conversation together. But I, I do feel that such such a behavior formed or emerged uh, from from the frequent usage of these um, well-known social networking platforms. Um, yeah, I think that's I I personally feel that's one of the reasons why people can call um, others as friends uh, easily especially maybe sometimes they don't mean friend on its actual meaning they're either being uh, excessively nice or uh, inaccurate I would say you know I also often um, this makes me contemplate why Facebook doesn't um Although I, I could definitely see going down this road would be 
um, really controversial <laughs> considering who you call, but I wonder if uh, like how Facebook ch uh, made different kinds of likes. Uh, I'm not on Facebook, so I, I don't know what they created so far uh, right now. I don't know what they have right now, but um, you know, they have, uh, you can like, you can dislike, you can be angry at something, you can be happy at a post, you can have all these different emotions instead of just a simple like. I wonder if um, uh, um, changing, uh, you know, having different levels of friends like you can call somebody a friend on facebook you can call somebody a colleague on facebook you can call somebody a close friend on facebook maybe these different levels could um although i could see that go down the wrong road <laughs> if you um if you uh, call somebody a close friend and then ultimately change them to just a friend <laughs> that might cause a different kind of controversy on the on the platform um i i tend to stay off it i tend to um i i i t got off facebook maybe two years ago now, maybe three. Um, I I just felt it was better. I don't need to see my friends' um, uh, um, meals to eat every day or, or see their latest updates. And to be honest, I found who my true friends are, not because they're better friends than other people, not because they're better people, but because they're the people who I want to exercise my friendship with. Um, I've noticed that I only stay in contact with the people that I truly want to stay in contact with um, uh, and make the effort to. I think that for uh, this works for me anyway. So this works for me that how I judge a true friendship is if I and the other person put in the effort to stay in contact. You know, Facebook, I feel like is a lazy way of doing it. But if off of social media, off of social media, you, you, both parties make that commitment to stay in contact. And I found that there are several people in my life who do that. They they stay in contact with me, and I stay in contact with them. So I can um, more easily distinguish between friend and non-friend or somebody else. Um, yeah, it's interesting. This is a really good discussion, also to uh, to kind of place stoicism in a modern context. What it, uh, how to deal with these ideas with these new tools and platforms. Um, Social media sites are a really good topic. Um, I wonder if, so on the other side of the coin, we, we talked a lot about friends. I wonder if in the in modern context, another type of tool we ha uh, we often use is um, uh, dating websites, right? So Facebook is really that kind of social media platform we use for friends. But in on the flip side, and that kind of other friendship, romantic love, I wonder if stoicism would also have a problem or, or a few different problems with using dating websites uh, or dating apps. I wonder if that, um, if there's a, if Stoicism would um, ban themselves from using these or or it, it, because they're perhaps um, a, a tool, of, a tool of, of passion, they would say, or there's an extent to which you can moderate your use with it. Um, and maybe broaden this topic to, so, to social media websites like Facebook too. Is there a way to just to incorporate these into your life without um, uh, um, uh, without it affecting you passionately um, uh, beyond beyond the point of just um, as Dan is talking about? I guess Dan, you 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 confront a lot of these people who overseas who, who ask you for money because this is not the first time you have mentioned one of these examples. Um, uh, but yeah, so my, my general question is, is there a way to use these platforms like Facebook and, and Tinder and, and Reddit and, and other social media platforms, maybe they're different from each other, and still stoically um, find irrational joy? You know, I did try that once when um, some unknown woman from um, Africa or wherever tried to chat me up. Uh, instead of just blocking her right away, I did try one time to say, have you ever considered Stoicism? Have you heard of Marcus Aurelius? <laughs> try try using your life your life for something productive instead of scamming people out of money. Mm -hmm. But uh, that didn't go anywhere. So I think she blocked me after that. That's uh, <laughs> um, that might be the most stoic thing she's ever done is to block you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think she took her first steps. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Does anybody here see see a problem with um uh, social media websites 
and um and and stoicism does anybody see like a real contradiction i mean is this um is there a way to use these websites and not be i guess so psychologically affected by them um that uh you could still remain i guess i use the broad term stoic but in a sense remain um virtuous and within control uh abdul yeah I, I may have an answer to that, but maybe not a very stoic one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, generally speaking, for me, I, I, I left um, social media for years now, maybe about three years, if not more. Um, and yeah, I mean, the only reason that I may be still using some of them is to stay in touch with uh, colleagues at university see so what i'm doing basically is i'm blocking notifications and i'm just keeping notifications for those um that are frequently in contact with but generally speaking like in the last year um or last two years there were not any sort of notifications uh, to a point that if you need to approach me <laughs> You need to call me, email me, or maybe uh, sending me a message. But if you approaching me on a social network, it may take a while. That if if I reply to it in the first place. So um, yeah, I don't use it very frequently. Um, I do use it to stay in touch with people that I care about keeping a uh, relationship with. Um, but yeah. There are those, I mean, social media I use like bi-weekly or on weekly basis, not daily thing. The daily thing would be the basic uh, channels of approaching or the traditional ones. Like when you say that people cannot grip, grip anything against you, saying, oh, why you not, you're not responding? Sorry, I, yeah, I don't use it if you need to approach me. Those are the ways <laughs> to approach me. And then that's a good answer, usually, to uh, these questions. But, yeah, I do think um, by minimizing these, um, you're minimizing loads of distractions there. Minimizing distractions is very important uh, uh, to stay focused. And it, it relates to the... Uh, um, uh, one of the disciplines of stoicism that we went through last year, uh, last week, which is uh, the discipline of desire. Like, <laughs> you cannot focus on your desires and aims if you're being distracted with notifications and sales offers and whatever that you don't care about. Um, if the, like, yeah, it's hard to focus on on the world that is full of distractions. Um, but what I do is, for example, YouTube is one of the frequently used sites, and I do use it for learning stuff and also from for leisure or watching something fun sometimes. So what I do is I have two channels. One of them is for having fun and joyful stuff, and the other one is for learning, more serious one. So when I go to the channel, even the suggestions are not like distracting ones because they are... Um, um, useful things that I need, I want to explore. And uh, a good tip is that you don't see the recommended videos. You always go to the subscription so that you don't see the other distracting stuff. So yeah, there are there are ways to stay focused on uh, social media uh, because you know if you want to stay connected with those who you want to care about, is uh, you need you need to use them. Otherwise. <laughs> you're on your own <laughs> uh, unless the people that you care about are around you and you don't need any sort of um, communication. Sorry, I'm dragging this, but yeah, I'll leave it there. Um, I'm going to actually go, <clears throat> I saw Dan's hand first, but I'm going to go to Tony because uh, we, um, he just came on recently and, and I think um, she should speak a bit more, but um, I think you're right just to summarize what you said, Abdul, that uh, actually, the first time I quit social media was because of privacy concerns, nothing to do with this. And this brings me up um, uh, with good, uh, good alternative reasons why not to use social media again. The idea of um, 
understanding friendship a bit more deeply and distractions, right? Reducing the number of distractions in my life so I can reduce the kind of cognitive dissonance I, um, I might experience and make decisions better, right? So I know what I desire. So I don't, there's not that ambiguity in, in what do I really want? I know what I want is it, I'm reducing my distractions. It's a really good point. Um, Tony. Yeah, um, soon as everyone else is asking, um, Dan, do you have $500 that you could lend me? Uh-huh, I knew it was coming. I, said, I, I think I'm the only person who hasn't asked you yet, so yeah. uh, I thought I'd, I'd get that in. Um, just on the question of social media, I think generally, you know, are we our own master or are we not? And it just it, it doesn't just apply to social media, but any distraction in our life which can be negative, which can take our energy. Um, as long as we remain in control, I don't think social media is an issue. I think once it oversteps the mark and becomes a general issue in our lives, and maybe it becomes unstoic in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No, it, it's a good point that um, moderation is always something, an element that's not um, uh, talked about often in the stoicism. But I think that just comes with the territory of being self-sufficient and self self-controlled. That um, you know how to moderate things and not let things kind of fall into an addiction or, or distraction. Um, Dan. Yeah, so in addition to um, uh, this commentary about uh, technology, I know sometimes I highlight the bad aspects uh, like I did a moment ago, but in general, as a Stoic, I view technology as a neutral thing, much like the Stoic teaching that the universe is neutral in nature and we can use it for good or bad ways. We can, uh, we can think that, oh, this thing is happening today. It's, I perceive it as good or bad uh, in my life, but ultimately technology is neutral and it's, um, um, I think it has a lot of potential. I think that also in terms of history sense, we can't go back. Technology is going to be here and it's going to continue to grow. It's part of our our globe now. It's a really good point you made. The last point, uh, um, I, I would, so I, this is why I'm sticking to the last point, and this is another discussion. I would tend to disagree about the merits of certain technologies, but I, I do very much agree that it's uh, it's a lot like love, actually, how the Stoics basically said, we may not like the total cons mind-consuming passion of love, but we're never going to get rid of it. So let's let's talk about how to deal with it and use it wisely. And that's a really good point you make that we can't ever get rid of this technology. It's in our lives. It's pervasive. So how do we deal with it? It's a really good point that you make that there should be a stoic position on it because it's in our lives. We should deal with it somehow. Maybe we can apply these same principles of friendship and, and love to, to this, I, this um, new environment of um, social media contacts. Uh, Shakam. Um, yeah, so first about uh, technology. Um, tools are just uh, tools, and human nature is um, to use them. So when um, a Art Nouvelle a made uh, dynamite, he thought only about uh, making uh, miners uh, work uh, easier. He didn't uh, think about all the military applications, but humans did what uh, humans do their best and uh, blew each other up. Um, same with gunpowder. So I don't think Facebook was meant to be this massive tool of misinformation and uh, wasting lifetimes of uh, hours uh, from, from people. Um, and so, so I think as long as you act with uh, wisdom and temperance, use uh, the tools uh, to, to your best ability. And to that note, how uh, did uh, the Stoics say uh, Say anything about um, uh, idle uh, gossip and, and conversation uh, in the marketplace? Because for me, that's that's Facebook, but uh, 
on a massive scale with the same um, uh, rumors, misinformation, dra- yeah, like useless drama. It's just humans on a gigantic scale. <laughs> That's all. So I don't see any, any new thing. It's also a really good analogy with the with the public marketplace. Like um, encountering some random stranger who is trying to take advantage of us is probably the same kind of um, yeah, uh, visualization Marcus Aurelius used in his journal when he said, this is who I'm going to confront today. And this is exactly maybe how you should approach social media. It's a really good tactic. Like I'm on social media. Okay, I'm going to have to deal with these kind of people today. And then... Uh, you'll be better prepared to deal with them. Hmm. Uh, Abdul. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate um, what all of you folks said. It's about um, the tools and they're neutral. Um, I mean, in the one hand, people would say, oh, those companies collecting data about me, but they do that to um, make you have better experience that shares with you uh, information or adverts that about something that you care about or something that you would be interested in. For example, you you wouldn't like seeing adverts of uh, baby toys, but rather seeing something about, for example, if you enjoy 3D printing, see something <laughs> more pleasant. Although advertisement in the first place, there's something annoying, but at least something better than the other. Um, so customizing experiences or collecting data to improve your experience. Well, on the other hand, saying, oh, they're collecting data so that they know more about me and, and uh, make abusing my privacy. <laughs> so it's kind of a trade-off and things can fall in between, in between many times. Um, but yeah, it's all about moderation and uh, uh, being in control. Good. Yeah. Um, and I'm adding this idea of moderation, um, which I think, um, I don't think necessarily falls under manager expectations. I think this is a different idea of practicing moderation, um, which might fall under the, the stoic practice of minim- uh, uh, to an extent, um, minimizing your comforts, um, where they want to avoid, um, uh, where they uh, don't want to avoid necessarily discomforts. Stoics sometimes like to, um, we always talk about uh, using discomforts here and there in our lives to get us used to these little discomforts in life. Um, and um, uh, maybe um, that completely avoiding social media is probably not, um, you, you can never do it. I never do it as well. Sometimes I'm just uh, re-sent to a Facebook page because of some address or I encounter people online because I'm on Reddit. So I'm not off of social media either. Um, I'm just off of the social media I don't like to use. Um, and I still, it still comes with that territory of, um, uh, um, and when you, uh, when you practice these little discomforts, you're kind of, um, you learn to moderate yourself, uh, because, um, Whenever you go back to the comforts, you're able to uh, understand not to have too much because you don't need it. Um, You know how to moderate it. I think that the act of substituting discomforts into your life can help you moderate yourself as well, moderate your use of certain things. Um, So that's a whole different tactic in and of itself. I really like that, that um, including discomforts into your life to, uh, to help yourself moderate your use of these things. Um, so that's everything I had. Uh, we went through some probably more questions than I thought we would go through, but, um, I really liked that last part of the discussion. Uh, it was really good to kind of apply this to mod- the modern age, because I know that, um, it sounded like a lot of people have either problems or questions or a re- would like discussion on the use of social media to an extent. Um, and I think these same stoic practices can help us in, in, 
the digital environment too, because as Shakam pointed out, this is like the digital equivalent of uh, the real marketplace or the environment. Um, we went over how the Stoics think of love and define it. Um, is love possible in Stoicism? Uh, what? How do we? How do we treat it? How do we practice it? Um, uh, is the Seneca's idea of um, choosing your friends carefully, not using the word friend casually, and hierarchies circles are they contradictory to each other? And um, then we end it with um, what does rational love mean, and how can we um, rationally find friendship in the digital environment? Um, so I think this is a really, really good discussion. We covered a lot of ground, especially in modern applications. Um, uh, Dan. Yeah, after that great summary, Steve, I think that um, uh, on the topic of love and friendships, it would have been great if one of the people in this group had arranged with their roommate or their partner to break into the Zoom meeting, you know, come into the room and we explode with fire and thunder. And that would be a great way to punctuate the end of a stoic meeting. What do you think? That's a really good idea, actually, to, um, uh, um, yeah, kidding aside, that's a really good idea to, like, model. Uh, uh, but it would have been even funnier if somebody did that without ever telling us in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> wow, wow, um, um, Tony's fighting with his, with his son. This is, this is huge. This is, um, uh, it would have been quite interesting to see something like that out of the blue. Um, Maybe quite Monty Python-esque. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, this is, yeah, this is a really good discussion. And I think this is also like, I think as we end it also really, um, a good starting place in the future, if we ever want to do modeling examples, um, like, um, examining, uh, kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for playing our roles and actually playing out themes or actual real life events and then dealing with, um, just, um, uh, um, uh, no script, coming up with your own words, coming up with your own situation, and then seeing how to deal with that in real time, stoically. Um, in the next few weeks, I thought, and I, I did this in the beginning, but I want to review what my kind of plan is for the month of April, that next week, I thought it would be good to more generalize and understand the stoic position on cosmopolitanism and hierarchy circles and the idea of interconnecting with the rest of society and community. And this kind of meshes with the idea of the month of April being the month of service in Stoicism. So that's in, in the modern Stoic world, the month of April is a month of service. Um, and unfortunately we can't do too much of that right now. Um, so uh, I am looking for ways in which we can act out our service uh, digitally. Um, or if you do get the chance um, in real life, please do so. Please um, let us know in the next meetup you come to um that would really be interesting or in the telegram group or the with the website forum would be really interesting to hear um but that is our um uh next week's uh meetup on service community and cosmopolitanism in, in, in stoicism and how we can actually do community service as a stoic um and the two meetups after that will be kind of a two meetup session uh two saturdays worth of marcus aurelius in honor of um in honor of his birthday on the um, on the twenty seventh. Um, so, if you haven't already, um, start reading or maybe rereading uh, sections if you would like on the meditations, um, because that's what we're going to be focusing on um, when discussing Marcus Aurelius. Um, it's quite nice, actually. We've been chronologically going through all the Stoics, and now we've kind of really, we're going to be making a, a nice footnote to the Stoic early Stoic chronology of or the late Stoic chronology, um, this end of the classical Stoic era. Um, and just as a last word, um, usually we, we end with what do we do over the next week? How, do, how, we, how can we practice Stoicism? Um, and continue practicing or reflecting on your emotions and your passions. Um, but more so this month, do some outreach, whatever you can. If there's digital ways you can do this, if you're able to out of, um, uh, out of maybe um uh, your country situation with the pandemic you can exercise some real real life community service um uh, do some service for your community um whether it's for your community at large 
um, whether it's uh, um, digitally um, subscribing or donating to a, a fund or charity or um, or if it's a an individual on an individual basis, um, outreaching to the community in terms of a stranger, um, uh, a very popular tactic, for example, uh, which we can get to in detail next week. But a popular tactic in Stoicism is to console other people. Seneca has these consolations he discusses um, that he um, taking the time if you have a friend in need or a family member you want to speak to, just consoling them, just sending them a text message or something that. Um, uh, that everything's going to be okay, that you're there for them, or just seeing, just checking up on how they're doing, how are you? Um, these kinds of outreach to the community or your neighbors, or your friends, um, is really important to stoicism. Um, so that's really our goal for this month, this community and, and other human outreach and service. How's everybody doing? How did everybody like this session? Awesome. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, I will see everybody next Saturday at six o'clock, uh, four o'clock, excuse me. Great. Thank you very much, folks. Um, thanks for having me. And thank you, Steve, for hosting it. Cheers. Thank you.